chapter 15 and verse 21. While you're turning there, let me just say tonight that we're probably not going to learn anything new tonight. And that that was always something that was on my list of what I wanted to accomplish. Anytime I was preaching any Bible study, that, that there would be a, a nugget God would bring across and we would learn something. I felt like that was a must. But, you know, we look at God's Word and it's repetitive over and over. We consider Peter at the end of his Christian life. What did he do? He brought to remembrance the Word of God over and over. So where we might not learn anything tonight, I pray that we're moved. I pray that we're motivated to fulfill our calling that is to happen on a daily basis in our lives. As you know, we're in a short series of messages and we're talking about witnessing and I've never been through a series quite like this on witnessing, but I pray that the Lord does great things in our lives as a result. And, and as I read this, I'll go ahead and answer what might be your question. No, I haven't forgotten what the topic's about. Just go with me, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, and we're going to look at these eight verses. It says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Here we have a Gentile woman whose daughter had a devil, and this mother went to Jesus for the healing. She didn't go to and spend all of her money on physicians or anything like that. She went to the right place. She went to Jesus for her daughter, but she was met with some discouragement when she did. She hit some roadblocks, some really tough ones. To look at this initially, it has the appearance of the situation as though Jesus is rejecting her. She has gone to the right one for this healing, but she gets an answer that, that sounds like rejection. You might even picture a frown on the face of Jesus uh, during this situation. He showed himself as though he was turning a deaf ear to her cry. She not only couldn't get any assistance from him, at first we read there that she didn't even so much as get any answer out of him. So what does she do? What do you do in such a tough time of rejection that she has gone through? Well, she became even more eager. And she became even more fervent in her request. And she did not miss a step. And she kept following after Jesus. You see, Jesus immediately has the answer. He has the answer before we even ask. But sometimes He doesn't give that answer immediately. And it's for our good. And it may be for a few different reasons we can think about tonight. Something that's very fitting here tonight 
is he's delaying to prove her faith. She was not only given words of rejection though, I mean the words that we just read that came to her was, were words that was like cutting off all hope for her. They were very blunt and very stern. And what does she do? She continues on and she worships the Lord. And she makes her requests. She didn't take the answer that Jesus gave. I'm not saying she was challenging Jesus. I'm not saying she was disrespectful. She wasn't. But that just did not fit who Jesus was to her. The disciple, we don't have record that the disciples said anything about that. They must have accepted what what. He was telling her. You know, they said, send her away, she's crying. And then he says things along the lines of what they said. And and they seemed to be going for it, but she didn't. She kept following him in haste. She followed him humbly. She became more humble as she went along. Though things became more stern for her, She was relentless and nothing could stop her from seeking Jesus for what she needed. What did she have that kept her from fainting? That kept her from quitting in the face of difficulty? In the face of rejection? What was it? Well, Jesus gives it away. He commended her for her faith. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Now that wasn't a scene of of typical witnessing to share your faith in Jesus for someone else to be saved. I will will throw this in before we move on, though. At first, he just walked along, and she was behind, and she followed him. Where were they going? It, It just may be that he was taking this Gentile woman into a group of Jews to show them what kind of faith they needed. They weren't all right with with their blood kinfolk to Abraham. They needed spiritual faith in the Son of God. And that's, that's for free. And that's just, a, that's just a thought on that. But this was about her faith. And why are we sharing this whenever it's about us sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others? Because there are going to be roadblocks, there are going to be hurdles, there are going to be difficulties that try to get in our way. We are going to get very discouraged, we are going to be tempted to be very discouraged as we share our faith in Jesus Christ. If you're ready for a lot of rejection, you're going to get it when you start sharing your faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And so, what we need to be faithful witnesses, because I'm not... It, this is not about us having just a, a little short series on witnessing and us getting uh, excited just a little bit for a few weeks to do so, but for the rest of our lives that we might be a faithful witness and it's going to be discouraging. There's going to be rejection and we need faith like this woman had to go tell others about Jesus Christ. We need to be pressing forward. The witnessing of Jesus Christ without becoming discouraged, without quitting, is going to require faith. Last week we talked about the importance of prayer to witness to others. This week, you know, it's not about you just go tell somebody about Jesus. It's about the faith that we need to grow in to do so. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says, you know, you might think about the faith that we need in this way. Us reaching our hand to God and God grabbing hold of us and uh, so that we don't faint and so that we don't fail. 
You know, Moses feared Pharaoh at first, who was rejecting God. When God grew Moses in his faith, he found Pharaoh funny compared to the fear he had in the beginning. He grew in faith. And that, that changed things for him. Weaklings become conquerors through faith. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Abraham, the Bible says, staggered not at the promise of God. Abraham called himself Abraham before he ever had children. He called himself the father of many children before he ever had them because he believed the promise of God. He set out looking for a city and never found it, but he kept on searching and he kept on looking for that city. And he went out and he trusted God in what he did. Abraham was a great man of faith. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He wasn't detoured by doubt. The, the element of faith in our lives and growing in faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We want more faith? Get in the Word of God and, and our faith will grow. There will be delays and denials and difficulties along the path of the faithful witness. And, and we have to be able to look beyond those things by faith at the purpose we have, the one who promises, the one who is going to fulfill his promises through us. You know, think about Paul. What was he doing on his missionary journeys? He was sharing faith in Jesus Christ. He was, he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere he went. And the barricades and the roadblocks that came against him, always working against him, trying to hinder him, trying to stop his work of witnessing for Jesus. How did, how did he make it through it? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is not something that we're going to be pulled forward. This is not something that's self-propelled, if you will. If anything, we're going to be pulled away. Or, or there's going to be attempts to pull us away. And so, we need to press forward. A co two things on faith here concerning our witnessing. Pressing forward, and then let's talk about some precise fundamentals for a minute. As in doctrine as in knowing what we believe, as in being grounded in what we believe concerning some gospel doctrines as we share Jesus Christ with others. There are some non-negotiables concerning the truth when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of them is the person of Christ. He is deity. He's not just a good man. He's not just a disciple or anything like that. He was born of not man and woman, but the Holy Ghost and woman. He is deity. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the express image of His person. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says, in other words, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. You want to learn about Jesus? John. John had such close fellowship with Jesus. The Apostle John loved to talk about Jesus. John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. We, we can see in there that Jesus is eternal. We can see in there the pre-existence of Jesus Christ before He ever came to this earth. He has no beginning and no end. We, we learn of His authority in the Bible. All power in heaven and earth was given given unto Jesus after the cross. And we can grasp these doctrines and our witness grows more effective the more we learn about the one we're witnessing about. Is Jesus Christ God Almighty? Yes, He is. The Bible says it's so. 
And so that's a non-negotiable when it comes to who is the person of Christ. He is God Almighty. How about His blood? How about the power of the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus Christ is innocent blood. The innocent died for the guilty. 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of my favorite verses. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He was born without sin. He lived without sin. The thief knew it beside him. He said, this man hath done nothing amiss. John said, there is no sin in him. So there is power in the innocent blood of Jesus to save and to cleanse. Not in the blood of bulls, not in the blood of goats or calves. There was the blood of the animal that was brought annually just as a covering, just as a shadow of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world when He was to come. And and with His own blood, He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Where are we in that? Where are we in any work to get that salvation from that phrase right there? Did you hear that? He... He entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. We have redemption through His blood. We have forgiveness of sins, not by our own merit, but by what He has done. According to the riches of His grace, we have forgiveness of sins. Revelation chapter 1 says, He washed us from our sins... In His own blood. A couple of folks from the church were out witnessing earlier. And you know, you hear a lot of wrong answers on how to get to heaven. But when you're out sharing your faith, door knocking, I mean, those are the people you want to be able to talk to. But it sure is encouraging when you go to a door. And well, well if I don't see you again here, how, how am I going to, you know, am I going to be able to see you in heaven? Yeah, I'm going to be there. How? The answer was only by the blood of Jesus. It's so encouraging to hear those right answers. And, and, a, and a brother or sister in Christ you're going to see in eternity. Uh, but, but we have some non-negotiable, precise fundamentals. The person of Christ, the power of His blood. How about the present of salvation? The Bible says that salvation is a gift. God gifts us with salvation. And it's given, salvation in Jesus Christ, it is given without work of any kind. If there is something that anyone listening in, anyone here, thinks that they have done by way of deeds or works in order to be saved, that's not being saved. That's not what God's salvation is. It's a non-negotiable. It is a gift, the Bible says. It's not a gift if we do something to earn it. And the gift of His salvation, it is unearnable. We, we, would, not, we would never be able to earn it. It is by no works of any kind. Salvation is by grace through faith. And that is plus nothing. The the witness, the faithful witness needs to be right about God's plan of salvation to be able to witness in His power. Salvation does not come by any works. It is not maintained by any works. It'll affect the condition of our relationship with Christ, but it will not affect the position that He obtained for us by way of redemption. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Salvation is a present. And let me just say this. Salvation is very simple. It's very simple. God wants to save everyone. And His plan is very simple. It doesn't take much knowledge to be saved. 
knowledge of sin, knowledge that we're a sinner, knowledge that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was without sin, died for our sins, was buried and raised again, and if we will trust in Him for the forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven, He will save us. It doesn't take much information at all. Salvation is simple. God provided everything we needed through His Son so anyone can be saved. Salvation is a present. It is a gift. And and as I started, we're not learning much tonight, but we're talking about non-negotiables as we share faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So how about the peril of mankind? Let's look at that for just a minute. Another, another door knocking and sharing Jesus episode. Some literature, some good gospel literature was put on someone's doorknob. They didn't take it and they didn't take it off and go inside and throw it away. They took it off, walked down their sidewalk, walked on the street in front of their house, went up the driveway to their outside trash can, picked up the lid and slam dunked it in there. Someone would say, why would someone do something like that? My answer is they were acting natural. That was natural for them. Man is a sinner by nature. Okay? So so when we share our faith, everyone needs that. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. People are, are weighing out their lives of, of the decent things they do, and the, the marks against them, and, and hoping that they've just done enough good that they're going to skate in and be okay with God. And look, it's good to examine our lives, and when we truthfully examine our lives, we see that we have no hope of heaven on our own. When we understand God's perfection, and we all fall short of God's perfection, we have no hope of heaven on our own. So it's good to examine ourselves in that light. But but in one sense, we can just look to Adam. We can just look to the first man. Because the curse of sin that came upon him passed upon everyone in the human race. The first man passed the sin curse to all of us. We are all personally, individually sinners. And every single human being has inherited that sin nature from Adam. That puts us in a position of beginning lost and and without hope. From the word go, we have no righteousness without Jesus Christ. Well, we have a righteousness, but they're filthy rags, Isaiah said. But kind of like the song says, one of my favorite lines to a hymn, this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus I have some words underlined in Romans 5 of my Bible, and and it talks about us being without strength and sinners and enemies. Elsewhere it says we were under wrath, condemned aliens and slaves of unrighteousness. Jeremiah 23, 12 speaks of slippery ways in the darkness. Look, there is no reforming from that. There is no refining from that. There is no level of education that is going to get anyone that we talk to to rise above what the sin nature has done to man. If the human being turns over a new leaf and does okay for a little while, it's not going to last. And, and no matter if it, how long it lasted... It's, it's not right in God's eyes. We don't offer ourselves, and it's never good enough. So everyone needs the gospel. You know, turning over a new leaf for a while, you know, how long will it last? How much good can we do? What does it really matter? 
compared to the analogy many people have used. If we're standing in California and we all plan to jump to Hawaii and some of us go five feet out and some of us make it ten feet out, we have, we have all gotten wet and we have missed our mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Sin is more deadly than cancer. Sin is worse than hell because sin is what sends a person to hell. I'm speaking all this for the heart of us and our witness to others. Everyone needs a remedy for sin because everyone is a sinner. The biggest house that one Christian ever knocked on the door of, they said, why don't you go over to the other neighborhood where people have more needs and maybe you'll have more luck with someone like that. And, and that person was told, everyone needs the same remedy. It doesn't matter what you have or how much you have. Everyone is a sinner and everyone needs the remedy for sin. Well, let's consider a, another non-negotiable, and that's the pureness of the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. You know, I hear statistics of so many people who don't believe that today. So I say it with a little more passion and a little more need to say that the Bible is the Word of God. It is God-breathed. It is infallible. It gives the preserved message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved here tonight, you are saved by Jesus because the Bible tells us how to be saved by Jesus. If someone told you about Jesus, they told you from God's glorious Word how to be saved from sin. The Word of God has recorded that. The Word of God will never fail us. It doesn't return void. It is given by inspiration of God. Men were moved by the Holy Ghost as the words of the Bible were recorded. The endurance of this attacked book gives an evidence in and of itself of the proof of its divine authorship. One must believe the Bible is the Word of God to be a witness. Otherwise, we're chasing our tail. And, and, and the witness is no good. To be an effective witness to the children of wrath, we must use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Bible, the Word of God. How about the precept to obey? The, what we call the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Christ is calling for every Christian's time and talent. Preachers have preached too hard on witnessing before because, because there is going to be conviction in those who are born again to witness for Jesus Christ, to witness of the message of Jesus Christ who saves. Lack of obedience is going to result in a lack of power for us to be effective in this, it's not for us just to do every now and then. It is to be our life that we share Jesus with others. We're ready to witness, by the way, the moment that we're saved. As I'm mentioning all these non negotiable doctrines, that's great to go home and look at them and study them, but don't think that you have to wait till you finish that to go witness to someone. As I said in past weeks, and I'll say it in future weeks, we are equipped and ready to tell someone how to be saved the moment we are saved. Because all we simply have to do is tell them what Jesus did for us and that He will do it for them as well. 
another, another precise fundamental. How about the, the punctual second coming? It's right on time whenever the Father calls for the Son to come to the clouds to get all of His people. We don't, we don't hear the preaching of the second coming all that much anymore. We don't, we don't talk about the second coming past the extent of, I sure wish Jesus would come back when we're in the midst of troubles. And I understand us saying that, but the Lord is going to return to gather His children and it's going to be right on time. And, and when is that going to be? Well, it's going to be at the perfect moment that only the Father knows. Is it, man, that the things are looking tough out there. People say, Jesus is coming soon. People say, He might not come in this decade. And that leaves about seven and a half years left. Let us not go set up on a hill and just wait for Jesus to come back. Let's not throw in the towel and quit just because we think Jesus is coming soon. We should be watching for and expecting His appearing, but we're not to drop life and just go sit on a hill and wait for His return. We're to be ready, and we're to be getting others ready. As many as we can... 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Do you love His appearing tonight? Knowing He's coming to the clouds to get us, we, we love His appearing as children of God. There are those out there who hate His appearing right now. Some of them will say it. Some of them will express that. Others say it by their lost condition, no matter, no matter what they express by way of attitude outside. There are those who hate the appearing of Jesus while we love the appearing of Jesus and what it would do for you and I who love His appearing to share what Jesus has done for us, that we went to Him a sinner, we believed He died for our sins, and we've trusted Him and He's made us new, and He'll do the same for you. We who love His appearing tell someone who hate His appearing that, and next thing you know, they might love His appearing. You might plant a seed in someone that will lead to their salvation. Maybe water that seed. Or maybe the harvest. How, how great... Can you think of anything greater that we can do? Can you imagine what the church would be like if we were all faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm not saying necessarily those, those we witness to coming to the church. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're going to witness on the other side of town where you work and people aren't going to come to church here. But I still say, can you imagine the church if we were all out doing that? Having the evangelistic heart, a caring heart, a compassionate heart, that's coming in a later lesson, for those who are unsaved, that they might be saved. Let, let's not just have a little run here of it. Let's be a faithful witness for the rest of our lives. What are we going to do with all the rejection, all of the discouragement, all the roadblocks, all the, all the Christians who could discourage you in some way about it? Faith. We, we pray, we're, we're, we're faithful witnesses who pray before we do anything, and we grow in faith. The way, that, the way this woman, the way she continued through the rejection and continued through the detours by her faith, that's what we do. The faithful witness is not just to go through the motions and go out and start talking, we need to do that, but we're going to stick with it when we grow in great faith. Her f great was her faith.
Let us grow in great faith as well. And you all come up and sing it out for the rest of the night. Love you all and God bless.